Well, it's Saturday night and the Gunners Club is open and I see you've invested me in a t-shirt. Well, I, I want you to look your best. Yeah, I feel as though I've come in the tradesman's entrance a bit here without having a collar. But I see one of us has had an effort to shave today. I had an effort. <laughs> it was misplaced, but I had an effort. <laughs> the world of gin. The, the, the proverbial girl's drink, is it? Is that what we're up against? Mother's ruin. <laughs> so, you know, going back to mid 17th, 1700s in England, in London alone, there were 7,000 shops selling just gin. So it's a very important part of our culture. But interestingly, it's not of English background. It's something that the French and the Dutch were very much involved in, and, and curiously, the Spanish as well. And the best way to make anything popular in England is basically to stop anything from France coming in. That's what they did. <laughs> of course. They stopped French brandy coming in and gin became incredibly popular. And now on the shelves, when I go to an alcohol shop, it's just full of slews of gins. But that's that's only a, a recent development, isn't it? Because gins, I mean, you had, you know, two or three varieties, mm. your standard fare, you know, your Gordons and your, you know, that type well of... Said. Pretty, pretty, pretty mediocre type of thing. Yeah, um, you're exactly right. So and we'd find things like the Tanqueray and the Gordons as a perennial that you find on the shelves, all of them in the London dry gin style. Yep. And that was basically it. That's but right. my God, they've kicked the doors open now. And what we have in front of us here really is only a small portion of our private range of gin and it is growing it's expanding all the time what we have we do have a lot <laughs> and actually what's available too and i've discovered for myself it's not just a sort of alcohol that you can pigeonhole it's not a girl's drink it's a drink for everybody to enjoy and i'm starting to enjoy it too one of the reasons i think that we're seeing a lot more of it in australia is the fact that a lot of people are starting to open up their own distilleries and to make something like a whiskey, you have to have at least three years of age on it. But that means you've actually got nothing to sell. There's no cash crop for at least three years. Oh, I think we could open a distillery. Well, curiously, you can. You just need a license to do it. Because if you don't have a license, um, it's two years jail time as the punishment. Yeah. And the curious I, thing is... Who I do don't think, want to play mummy. <laughs> who, who do you think in Australia issues the licence for you to have your excise manufacturing licence for alcohol? Taxation department? Yep. <laughs> it's not, not the medical board or anything like that. It's actually the Australian Taxation Office. So we might have a drink to them later on. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I'll put something in your glass for starters because I want you to get a bit of a concept around what is a gin. Why don't you try what you've got there in front of you? I, I get the big boy glass. So here's my oh, question. Oh, that's a citrus of some sort. Oh, but here's my question. What is it that you've just drunk? Well, you just told me it was a gin, didn't you? I didn't tell you it was a gin. And in fact, it's not a gin. You liar! Yep. Maybe, maybe I'm a liar or I'm lying just to prove a point, omitting the truth. Okay. So these are basically what we call neutral spirits. And vodka is typical of a neutral spirit. But it doesn't mean that you can't put botanicals into it. Now, I'll just quickly say what a botanical is. Anything which is plant-based is basically a botanical. Um, when it comes to the flavours that we have here, some of them are native and some of them are European or Asian based. I'm particularly excited about Australian gins because we've got so much unique botanicals that we can share. Things like wattle seeds, uh, finger limes, uh, macadamias, uh, eucalyptus, pretty much anything you think which is special to Australian food, the old fashioned bush tucker, that's something that we can share to the world. We can bottle it and we can share it. Now, this has got some of those botanicals in it, but the reason it's not a gin and we'd have to call it a vodka is it doesn't have juniper in it. And that's basically the hard and fast rule. If it's a gin, it has to have juniper in it. I mean, the name itself actually comes from, originally from the Latin through the French, for what the juniper berry is. That's what it is. So is that the law? That, that's the law. Now, there is, that's a hard and fast law, but in terms of what the percentage has to be for flavouring for juniper, ah. usually observed as more than half in Europe, but countries like Australia were a little bit hard and not hard and fast but so, so, loose and so soft you can law. just wave it over the top and say it's now got juniper in it I, I guess almost a homeopathic <laughs> <interaction> <laughs> to juniper. 
But isn't this great? Don't you think this is great? And this is wax flower vodka. I think it's absolutely amazing. Uh, it's a neutral I would not spirit, have picked that as vodka. But the taste is amazing. I would not have picked that as vodka. Uh, again, it's that simple distinction between having the juniper berry in it and not. Now, Eugene, for me... That is very citrusy. Oh, that is actually beautiful. nice. We might just wave that in front of the camera again. Now, that's Melbourne made, Melbourne, Australia. So I'm proud that we make stuff as great as that here. Oh, like our whiskies, but yeah. And that's made by Tiny Bear. So if you're interested in looking out for them. Tiny Bear. Tiny Bear. Now, for me, when it comes to a really good standard of Australian made, Victorian made gin, I really like the Four Pillars. Now, an international mob has become involved in the investment in it, thrown a lot of money into it. And if you're ever down Hillsville Way, it's well worth a visit uh, if you're of legal drinking age to go and have a look at this. Uh, it's just a beautiful theatre. It's wonderful. And the time that I was there with my wife was in the morning after the night before when they'd won a very important world award for best gin. And it, it was a really good vibe out there. I think that the gin is fantastic. It's a beautiful standard. Uh, that's the reason why I have their rare gin. <laughs> also the reason why I have their rarer <laughs> gin. Of and, course. Uh, I mean, if we have to go to Hyperbolics, also the reason why I have their rare rest. Bit of difference between it. This is more the neutral spirit, the rare. I think it's a real crowd pleaser. If you're looking for a good gin, that's something I would invest my money in. That's something you would, uh, you'd use a mixer for, as in with tonic and so on. So let's have a little bit of a talk about tonic. Um, it's a funny thing that tonic has become so associated with drinking gin. Um, gin was really created, you put juniper berry in it because you had very bad alcohol and you wanted to get rid of the taste of very bad alcohol. The reason why people took tonic was essentially going back to the colonial days where it was pretty much the only medicine they had for malaria. And the taste of the tonic was so bad that they had to get rid of the taste by adding gin to it. So we have that curious thing of that the flavour has been so bad of the, of the alcohol they have to add botanicals to it and then the tonic being so bad that they had to add alcohol to it. So it's a funny so, horse so, before the cart thing. So in reality, uh, we're drinking this purely for medicinal purposes. Well, you haven't drunk yeah. any gin whatsoever at all yet, but you'd be right. <laughs> I like where this night's going. <laughs> I... Like I've said, I really enjoy the differences of Australian produce, the fact that we can put so many different flavours, whatever comes out of the earth, we can pretty much put into it. Um, but not only that, when it comes to the alcohol as well, the alcohol that's used for gin, strictly speaking, you can use anything that you like to make the alcohol. So for example, Four Pillars, they buy their alcohol, it's already made um, by Manildra, and Manildra deal with um, wheat, mm. and so it's wheat based ethanol and what they do is they add the botanicals to it hmm. that's interesting tiny bear however which is what you've got in your glass they actually in the small site they create the alcohol themselves uh -huh. so they make both the alcohol they don't buy it in but you can make alcohol out of basically anything um, you're used to drinking beers or whiskies which is made out of grain certainly you can do that and that's traditional for gin um, but people becoming a bit more clever and starting to use grape as well like wine ah uh, yes grape juice as well to make alcohol well that's something else but what about vodkas that are traditionally made of tubers or potatoes like, like this gentleman so alcohol can be made of that or if we think to our friends in central asia who make alcohol out of whey you know milk product so the mind doesn't have to be confined to one source for the alcohol just as it doesn't have to be combined uh, confined to one sort of flavoring I think the Australian stuff is great. I think we smash it out of the park. But there's some stuff which is just so left of field, Eugene. For example, the Greek produce. Now, Greece is in the Mediterranean, which means that they're blessed by God for having pretty much the best selection of botanicals on earth. They just do. That's why Italian cuisine is so highly rated, French cuisine and Greek cuisine as well. I can't say that I'm the world's greatest fan of their gin, but it is so different. This is called a 2020, uh, and they boast that they use 20 different sources of botanicals in making it. Okay, 20. Yeah. Is that like the 11 secret herbs and spices? <laughs> it's the 20. Yeah. Yeah. Can you drink it with KFC? You got that, time that, to order it in? Yeah. Then you'd have 31. 
I think you're onto something there. I, I think I to think how many herbs number. and spices were in it. I think 21's on, on the magical number, but you've got some other Australian ones that you were oh, desperate to show me. I was. And and you were speaking about um, wine, um, wine spirit. Mm, that's right. Well, Mrs. Baker, <coughs> who runs a micro distillery, um... They um, uh, they have a winery, a vineyard, and they're, um, <coughs> when we visited them, they said that um, they had a particularly bad year and um, the grapes had got all mildewed and so forth. And so their whole crop of grapes was basically, you know, chuck it out or dig it in. But he decided, well, I'm not going to waste a good thing, and he distilled all these grapes down to make his own uh, spirit and decided to make his own gin out of it. Now this particular gin oh, oh, mm. oh. It's peculiar isn't it because the <sighs> fennel which he's put into it. Yes. Mm. It, I just would never have put the two together and it tastes phenomenal. So I think we should try that and what I'd like to do is just show you quickly the sort of glassware that you can buy specifically <coughs> just for gin. A gin glass. So this is a gin glass. Now you can blame the Spanish for the shape of this. Um, again, I said that there were particularly uh, people who loved gin. Um, so it's very round. It's rounder than what you'd expect from a wine glass. It probably looks just like a normal wine glass for you, but it's easy to stick your beak in. And also there's more room for other accoutrements that you want. Oh, you might want to I use some wine. big words. You might want to use plenty of ice and tonic as well. Now generally when people add tonic, Schweppes just is a market leader because of the size and the international reach of it. Um, there's a lot of small generic mm. um, flavoured tonic waters now which are becoming really popular in Australia. Um, quite a few of them coming out from England yep, as well. Yep, that's right. I think the girls are having a cocktail later tonight with one of those bottles. I dare this say is what more than one. <laughs> so Certainly you can add as much ice as you want. The more ice that you add, <clears throat> the more you're going to anaesthetize your tongue. You're going to get less flavor out of it. But the general ratio is, um, you know, one quarter of your glass that you have of liquid will be tonic, uh, sorry, be gin. And then three parts of it will be the tonic quarter. But I think the best thing to do is always just try the tonic, try the gin first. So you actually get a taste of it before you go ahead and add too much of the sugary water to it. So do you want to try the, the fennel one? Oh. Let's, let's do it. Do you want some ice? I think so. Well, let's do the eyes. <laughs> I know where my fingers have been. Do you want to know where my fingers have been? Uh, <laughs> let's pretend I know where they were. <laughs> I'm happy to share. In the sink. <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Baker's was really interesting to go to because he foraged a lot of the ingredients himself. So he'd be able to point to the trees where some of the ingredients came from. Yes. Which is, I just think that's marvellous. Oh, that is just Yeah, unique. and again, Australian produce. We're, we're so proud that we have this beautiful produce. Now, I'm going to try it first without adding any water. Again, Mrs. Baker's... What is it? Oh. Mrs. Baker's still house is what they're actually called, and, they, and, and their fennel gin... You ready for this? Is called Loud and Rebellious. A lot like me, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can take the flag down and just put this bottle up instead. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, so really medicinal sort of taste and flavours. And really, that's one of the reasons why gin was so popular. <clears throat> People thought it actually was a tonic for you. It was something that was good for you. Um, and then later on, around the 1730s, when you had some of the artwork depicting Gin Lane, uh, the mothers who were dropping their babies into gin vats, um, sitting on the steps with scabby knees and scabby legs, and people just gone to woe, people with the ribs exposed, and, and people basically just fall into woe because of gin. <laughs> A little bit like licorice or sauce. Mm. There's really almost no end to what you can add mm. to That's gin, very nice. with the exception you can take everything away from it apart from the juniper. Other things you can do, <laughs> I've seen people simply buy neutral spirits themselves. Uh, 
and then put it into a jar <clears> and <throat> essentially add extra flavours that they want. Hmm. Things which are particularly popular with making gins are things like rinds. So you might have orange rind yeah. or lemon rind. Um, other things which people use apart from juniper, but some people do like to add extra juniper. Um, you can use things like angelica. Angelica is always thought of as one of the major things that you need for it. So you've got juniper, angelica, which is of the same family as carrot or celery. Mm. Um, right. And then also add, you know, the cardamom to it as well. So those are typical things you can flavour it with. Um, but some people, particularly mm. English, like to use a lot of fruit. And that's where we got the word, the slough, the S-L-O-E. In case you're wondering what that is, it basically means that for the flavouring, they added a lot of fruit <coughs> into it. And often the fruit could be used for the alcohol as well, huh. but certainly for the flavouring. So I thought I'd just pick this one out of your collection. Just to remark particularly upon that, because that's another... That's, uh, that's also quite unique, because it's not a clear spirit like the rest of them are. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's for you to play with. This is really your apothecary, um, and you can play with it and create whatever flavour profiles you want. And some of the stuff we've got here runs the full gamut to... Oh, we went to this place, and that was a little Lonsdale Street, It was, wasn't and it? it's, it's, it's called close to the Lonnie, House. Little Lonnie. And how many metres from um, Parliament House? It's really yeah. on the doorstep, isn't it? <laughs> it's rumoured that Parliament House had an underground tunnel leading to it. That, that's a really fun night. Make sure you book if you do decide to go there to Little Long. But they do a ginger one. I think it's called the Ginger Mick, isn't it? Yes. Oh, my God, it's so good. Yeah, that's wonderful. I was going to... I thought you reminded me of something, but, you know, at my age, it... it Comes and goes real quick. As, as long as it's not one of your past dates. Be quite happy. <laughs> now, what else I'm finding quite interesting in the Australian market is we're starting to get some American produce as well. Aviation, I think, is very well known in America. Um, had a little bit of a bumpy start in Australia. The shop I bought it from was actually discontinuing it. So I got it for a run out. Um, but the, the word aviation is actually quite synonymous with early gin as well. Um, it's been basically co-opted by the Americans though for this produce probably the most beautiful bottle in the business but for me oh here we go the <clears> best <throat> gin that I've ever tried and I haven't tried this lovely Melbourne produce oh. that Seuss is about to introduce me to is Silent Pool now my brother stumbled upon this uh, there was a range of about a hundred different gins in the store he went to and this was very close to the first one that they had on the rack I don't know why it doesn't start with A um, but I think it's everything a gin should be it's not something which is too challenging it's your typical juniper forward gin that is just wonderful it's a pretty bottle why don't you try some well it would be rude not <laughs> to <think> so. <laughs> and I love the glass stopper hmm so general gins in Australia, it's usually around the 40% alcohol. You see quite a lot of them at the 37, 37.5% for the cheaper end. Um, with the tax in Australia, though, if you're buying a $40 bottle of something, say, probably something along the lines of the Gordon's Gin, I don't know exactly the price of that. About $25 of that $40 is simply that excise tax that you're paying. On top Crazy. of that, you'll pay the GST. And on top of that, the tax will have to be paid by the storekeeper. You'll have to pay wages and payroll tax on top of that. And it goes on and on and on. So basically what we've got in front of us is tax. Um, but that's basically the way the Australian economy started as well, when rum mm. in the convict days actually was the source of Australian currency. Again, going back to the Spanish, before we imported a whole lot of Spanish currency. We will be doing a future video on rums. Stay tuned. Promise. For, stay tuned Promise. for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so try this for me. It's waxy. It's refined. It's botanical. We it's very different. To I do, you know what? I like this, which is this one. Mm. It's got, spe it's got specific flavour. Mm. I like the first one that you gave oh, me, yeah. which wasn't even a gin. Yeah. You're telling me, it's actually a vodka with flavours, if you like. Yes. Okay. I like that one again. That had a specific flavour, in, in, in this case, citrus. This one, I get it, but very different. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. not sure whether I like this one. 
Okay. Difference opinions. I mean, I, I wouldn't throw it out of bed to get to you, but you know, <laughs> it's it's not bad. <laughs> I love it. I, I, think it's, I think it's wonderful. Maybe you're more of a bathtub gin man. You see, now we're talking. <laughs> so you know, to make bathtub gin in the old days, they would basically let any vegetable matter decompose. It could be potato skins, hmm. it could be fruits. They'd add a bit of glycerine into it. I thought that would get your interest. Well, it needs to slide down somehow. <laughs> yeah, which glycerine, which is basically just a, an oil seed, mm. um, derived oil. And then on top of that, you'd add just a bit of flavour. And the flavour would probably just be a, a juniper flavour rather than actually giving it proper juniper berries and things like that. Just enough to make people convinced that it's something that's drinkable. And prohibition as well. It, it had such an impact on the gin culture in America with yeah, people yeah. wholesale importing large amounts of uh, neutral spirits from Canada and then basically adding anything to it so that you had something which was ostensibly drinkable. Um, I don't know how good it was. Unless you health. went blind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where, where the saying comes from, blind drunk. Now, right in the heart of Melbourne, cultured Melbourne, Cult, cultured Melbourne. is Brunswick. Yes. Now, there's a bit of a story to this. We went to the um, annual home show um, here in Melbourne, which is predominantly a housewares type showcasing scenario. And lo and behold, the only thing we bought at the home show <laughs> was gin. As one does. Now, you were talking about pretty bottles. I was. Check this out. They have a range. It's called Aces. And they're the different cards in, in, the, in the deck range. Oh, I see. All right. So they've got them all. The hearts, clubs, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole bit. And each one... <laughs> Just no juices. Yeah. <laughs> and each one is a different flavour. So this one's spades. That one's hearts. Um, these are just... Oh, they're gorgeous. I, when amazing. I came in, I actually thought these were perfume bottles. You know, apply liberally, as you do. It would have to be liberally with the size of these bottles. Yeah. Now... They had samples, of course they had samples, and we didn't want to be rude. <laughs> so we sampled liberally, <laughs> as one does. Um, so we bought a couple of them. Now, um, they are oh so good. Okay, you know so this buy? is native wattle seed, cassia bark and star anise, so it really goes back to that whole thing of wearing the Australian heart on its sleeve. Mm -hmm. For that reason, I would, if that one's going to be opened, I'd be very happy to try that. Well, only because you asked me so <laughs> nicely. Now, these are quite unique. Aha, uh -huh, look at that. Look at that. Now, they're very unique. Oh, perfection. Because, if you look down the side, um, it actually has the nip sizes. You pour it into there. Beautiful. And it gives you the perfect measure. In the lid. So How let's good do that? It. You know the shape reminds me of the old Avon bottles. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Get your lips around that. I mean, completely different to the nose. I can smell the cassia straight away. Mm. Oh, so, yes. so cassia basically is a cheaper version of cinnamon. It's basically bark. Oh, but my, the nose is fantastic. I mean, I've tried 50 different gins. At least, I've never had anything which even comes close to the flavour profile of that. Now, it's completely different to anything I'm used to. And, and I'll be honest, I'll have to have a few more sips to see how much I enjoy it. That's not bad, is but it? But that's the thing. It's not like um, sitting at a bar and you've just got Coca-Colas or generic bourbons lined up. Every single thing is different. It's got a different flavour profile because it really shows um, the difference and the vitality of the land in which you're living. Yes. Like I said, when you try this Greek one, and I'm not convinced by how much I like it, I'm convinced by how much I know how different it is to anything made in Australia or the traditional English, 
or the American stabs at, at Jim. Doesn't this remind you of a hot, you know, a hot cross Again, bun or, or Christmas pudding? Or, yeah, yeah, amazingly good. So anyway, we couldn't help ourselves. We thought it would be rude not to try them. Do you remember in the previous video when we had the, um, the cage fight with the cinnamon... Um, with the cinnamon liqueur, yeah, cinnamon whiskey. I'm still licking my wounds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you did claim second prize, so you know it's <laughs> nothing to be ashamed of. And I don't know whether you recall, but I had this saying, which I still hold true, that if big is good and bigger is better, and you made fun of my plastic no, bottle. No, no, no. I thought your mantra was up here for thinking, down here for dancing. Yeah, but by the time I finish drinking it all, I'm not much good for dancing. Anyway, if big is good, bigger is better. Well, now that's what you call big. <laughs> Five and a quarter litres of fireball. You know, from the exact shape of that and the colour and the size. I wouldn't let any dogs into this mess. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Looks too much like a fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> so really, this is a welded gin. But the other thing I wanted to let you know, um, I talked about the way that it's made and the different ways that you can infuse flavours into it. You could buy, basically, a vodka at home and add the things to a jam jar and add the botanicals and things you wanted. Or you could buy something which is already made yep. to the flavour profile you want. Or, yeah. oh, here we go. going back again to the Spanish, because they, they really are an integral part of the history of and the love of gin. Have a look at this. This is I've got six different flavour profile things here, and these are just like tea bags. So what you do, you have a read through what the flavour profile is that you want. You get these little boxes. and So just you could like basically you have, add this to vodka. You could basically add it to vodka. It is designed for gin, but you could add it to any base spirit okay. that you wanted to. So essentially, it's like a deluxe tea bag, the pyramid with the, the beautiful material. Add it in. Now, the one which is red, I believe, is only for two minutes and it's ready to go. The other ones, the flavor profile is a bit different and they expect you to have it there for four to six minutes. You could probably drink something else whilst you're doing that. <laughs> um, but again, it's a way of shaking up what you've got. Now, don't be upset if you've only got a basic dry London gin. Um, in the larder at home because you could buy a more expensive tonic to add to it. You could get a wedge of lime or something like that to add to it. You could even consider doing something like this. Um, the other good thing you could do is cocktails. Now, I was lucky enough to go to um, the Raffles Hotel in Singapore, which is the home of the Singapore Sling. Now, what they do to gin, uh, to some people it might be unconscionable because it had a lot of very sweet spirits and things like that to it so they'll garnish it with cherries they'll add your Cointreau and they'll add all sorts Cointreau. of sweet liqueurs to oh. it um and that's fine and dandy i did actually have a look to see what they were using for spirits and they originally did only use gordon's gin to make it in the bar oh, and then traditional since moved across to a singapore um produced spirit that they call squidges that's what they use today but the thing is there really is no limit if you've got other things in your game to go for a cocktail just have a look on the internet add to it you've got these beautiful things you've got the jam jar at home um or you can simply say i think i'm going to try something from australia instead that's got a flavor profile i haven't tried or be brave like i did get something from greece and say well i'm not sure if i'm going to like it but i want something which is completely different to anything that i'm used to at all and that, that really, to me, is a world of gin. Well, it's opened my eyes. It's opened my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and please, we'll hold it there. <laughs> well, if you like it, what do they have to do? Well, I'm going to keep drinking. But what they can do is they can like, they can subscribe, and let us know down below if you like what you're seeing because we're happy to make more. Well, I don't know about happy to make more. We're happy to drink more. <laughs> you guys have a good one.